in particular. If anybody calls in, you just have to press end. If anybody calls in, you just press uh, the red button, right? Just you know, hang up on them. If anybody calls in on my phone, just hang up on them. But put it on um, on Wi-Fi, so then phone calls won't come in. And, and shut off the, um, what you can call it. Uh, Wonderful. So we're good. So we're live. Mm. Fully alive. <laughs> of course, if we're talking about Tanya, we can only but be fully alive. <laughs> so I know it's somewhat of a silly question, but. How would you sum up what Tanya is before we try to apply it to ourselves? Mm. I have maybe a more silly question. How do you sum it up in one word? Okay. It's <laughs> a good challenge. So it's my, uh, you know, often a... Uh, a thought that I have in different areas. And I put it in one word as mamish. It's interesting that, you know, the Alter Rebbe in the second chapter, he quotes from the Medrash and he adds only for the godly soul. That you could take it as non-literal, that it's uh, just, uh, it's not real. It's, you know, it's an idea, but it says mamish, it's real. So I, I think what, the Alter Rebbe is trying to do with us is to bring a reality that seems to be, you know, a figure of speech. It's it's nice. It's spiritual. It's a nice visitation to it, and you know, and to make it real, and to make it something that you could truly live with um, in a daily basis and use it as your guide in life. So, just. Uh, Mamish. That's true. Later on in Tanya, when the Rebbe quotes the Mishnah, the Rebbe does it again. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Have they? It's, it's real. That's what it is. It's a reality. And, and what he does is uh, give us in a uh the Tuvtam Vidas in an intellectual manner in a way that we could own it and make it real for us it's not just a um a nice um spiritual kind of uh high you know that inspires us in the moment but then afterwards we kind of find ourselves back in the you know back to our our former reality what he does is make that reality something that we we, we get it and when we get it, then it's something that we can actually uh, apply, you know, which is amazing. It seems like this is the difference between the Alter Rebbe and the other Talmidim of the Magid. They were able to produce inspiration, but not from within. The inspiration to the Hasid came from the Rebbe. And that didn't make it quite real to the Hasid. Exactly. He was just reacting to how real it was to the Rebbe. And this well, was when you think about it, it's a, it's a spiritual it. reality that it's very, uh, a, a high spiritual reality that is, is somewhat challenging. And that's, I guess, for the Alter Rebbe, you know, got with the Smetana, he got the cream of uh, of his uh, teacher, the Mizuchi Magid, that was able then to bring it in a way that it, it is Mamish, it is real for us. 
Yeah. Why, why are we getting an echo? Um, I'm having a difficulty. <laughs> I'm not hearing through this now. <laughs> Challenges, but uh, it's a choppy. A different one. No, I hear your voice twice. Oh, really? Oh, okay. So there's obviously some kind of problem here. It's not bad. It's like Mavra said there. Stay you making up. Early, early in the week. Hold on one sec. Is that better? Is that better? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Twice. <laughs> I hear you double. <laughs> Does that mean everybody? That means everybody's hearing me twice. That I don't know. Mm. Try turning off the radio. Try. Sorry. How is it now if I don't use this? Say again. Say again. Now, now I'm echoing. Now I'm echoing. <laughs> How's that? Okay. How, do echo? Find, how do we find out what the people are hearing? I'm not hearing you. Oh, obviously I'm not hearing you because it's not plugged in. How's that? How's that? And better? better. Twice. 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 I am not a techie. Hmm. Should have had my son here. Mm hmm. It stopped. You hear me? You hear me? Yeah. Yes. How's that? So we're not on Instagram. Oh, did did you end that or someone ended it? Someone did. Aha. Okay, so I guess it means that Instagram's not going to work. How's YouTube working? This is on YouTube still, right? It's working. You hear me, right? I hear you. And <laughs> it's good or not? <laughs> hmm? I hear you, but it's uh, the, the video and the, and the audio are not synced. Oh, man. What does Almond say? He's not there. Mm. He's not. You can see me, right? And you're not double. You're not. It's perfect on my end, but I'm. I'm not seeing it on YouTube. Mm. Let's see. Second, let's see, I have it here, YouTube. Let, let me see how it's playing out in YouTube. Continue the conference. How, yeah, on YouTube, it's okay. I, I don't think there's an issue on YouTube. I think the issue is uh, maybe in the setup that you have. Mm. So I, I think we can continue unless it doesn't sound Oh, it sounds fine. It's just the video and the and the audio are not. Uh, uh -huh. But that's fine on 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 YouTube. Actually, you know what? Let me double check. <clears throat> yeah, no, it's it's. Uh, I'm watching it on YouTube. 
uh, from the live and it's okay. It's right. synced. Okay. All right. So where were we? <laughs> we're talking about uh, how Tanya makes godliness mamish. Yeah. Tangible, real. Now I can't hear you. You don't hear me? Now I hear you. Yeah, I wasn't talking. That's why. I was mm. listening. Ah, uh, so I got to stop looking at the picture because on the picture you're talking. Ah, okay. Because <laughs> the, there's a delay there. Don't look. Right. Look, right, right. look on Zoom. Okay. Let's look, we'll look on Zoom. We'll fabring with each other. We're not fabring with YouTube. <laughs> okay. And we'll, uh, we'll be okay. Good, good, good. So um, if you were to put Tanya into one word, that would be? Well, I, I think you, you hit it right on, the, right on the button. If anything, that's what Tanya does. And that's what Chassidus does, of course. Chassidus Chabad. Right. So the internal self-generated inspiration is not as... As, as dramatic as the inspiration that comes from a tzaddik, but it's more real and therefore more lasting. So it's a good thing. Absolutely. Now the question is, how is it possible? How is it possible for a human being to see holiness, godliness as real, as tangible. You know, there are different things that make reality for different people. You know, for some people, all reality comes from what they feel. If it moves me, if it touches me, then it's real. If it's just a theory, nah, that's not real. A person who is more Megushim, only if he can touch it with his hands and taste it with his mouth, then it's real. Other than that, it's all theory. And then there are people who we call intellectuals. To them, the fact that it's logically compelling, that's what makes it real. What you see, what you touch, that's not real. What you feel, emotions, reactions, that's not real. But if it's logical and convincing, that's reality. And that's what makes an intellectual. So there's a difference between an intellectual and a genius. Not every genius is an intellectual and not every intellectual is a genius. Because right. you can have a person who is a real genius, but that's not reality to him. Reality is what he feels. Like in the in the secular world, Mozart. Mozart was a genius, but that was not where he lived. That was not his place. His place was in some juvenile feelings or whatever. So an intellectual may not be a genius, but whatever he knows is absolutely real. But that makes sense if you're talking about knowledge of the created world, which can be so, which is so knowable that it's like you're touching it, but with your mind's eye. But when it comes to godliness, it really shouldn't be possible. How can a human mind really grasp godliness and i think that's why the other the other disciples of the magid were not convinced that this can work if you try to understand god you'll just become a philosopher but so what happened you'll miss the godliness of it because godliness cannot be captured in, in intelligence. 
But that's why the Bardichev Rebbe's reaction to the, to the manuscript of the Tanya, how can you put, how did you manage to put such a big God into such a little safer? What he meant was not the size of the Tanya, the print, you know, the edition. Right. What he meant was a little safer means a human mind. How do you put godliness into a human mind, which is a tiny little book? But the Alter Rebbe answers that in chapter four, saying that Hashem compressed his infinite wisdom and put it into Torah, into 613 commandments that deal with a material world. And he put himself, that's the key. He didn't put like, Right now, what you're sharing and anything that I share is a, is a glimmer of, our, uh, of, of what's in our brain, <laughs> right? The Eibishter Hashem, what he did was put himself in that and made him, himself accessible to a human mind as a result um, and, and, and made it that we could internalize his divine wisdom. Yes. You, you know your Tanya. So, so this is the answer to people. I say to them, there's a mitzvah of Yediyas Hashem. What are you doing about that mitzvah? In other words, what do you know about Hashem in fulfillment of the mitzvah to know him? And they say, know him, less machshavot visabe. No thought can grasp them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that took you a whole two hours to figure out? <laughs> <laughs> this is what you've been studying for years and years, and you come to the conclusion that you cannot understand him? Something's wrong. Because if less mashava tvis obey, then how can you have a mitzvah to get to know him? He's not knowable. What do you want from me? So yes, the answer is exactly in what you're quoting. Because he is not knowable, that's why he puts himself into the Torah, so that instead of less machshavat visabei, kol machshavat visabei. Instead of being unavailable to any intelligence, not even the angels, in Torah, God becomes available to every intelligence. So that seems to be a very basic concept in Tanya. How is it that the Talmidei Hamagi, the students that were there together with the Alter Rebbe, seemingly this basic concept, should be something that they got and you know without uh, <laughs> without any great difficulty is there a, a a a nuance to this that they would understand differently i always wondered that it doesn't like this is very fundamental and basic yeah, once you learn Tanya. I guess, I guess once the Alter Rebbe was kind enough to share the share it with us. Yeah. So it must be that if you look at it a little bit externally, the Torah is, is, a, is a taste, a tiny little taste of what God is. Certainly not the whole thing. So it's a reduced, uh, palatable, digestible, bite-sized little piece of godliness. Mm -hmm. And the proof is, you can understand it. <laughs> right. So a vertel that gets you excited is something that is, uh, like you say, a bite size, um, as opposed to any in-depth understanding of, of godliness. Right. And that's Which the path the that they took. Has. So since the tzaddik has that deeper insight, 
His connection is much greater than anything you can ever achieve. So let him inspire you. And that'll get you to the highest level. Yeah. So part of the Chiddush is what it says in the Zehar, which of course they all knew, that that the Torah and God are really one and the same. But what does that actually mean? Obviously, you can say anything that is completely holy is him. Because what else is it? Like if a tzaddik has no yetzahara, then he's completely him. But you don't mean that literally. You mean there's no ungodly side to it. Since there is no ungodly ingredient in Torah, so what do you say? So the Torah is him, not anything else besides him. But again, it's just a little slice of the pie. Right. What the al Rebbe is saying is that you have to take it literally. The Torah is him. Not because it's holy, because it's him. And that, Which means, and, yeah. And that shows itself in the fact that uh, today, you know, we're like, we just, uh, last week was uh, Chavdal Tevis, the earth site of the Elter Rebbe, and after 209 years after his passing, there's more people learning Tanya today than ever before because it is of him and just as God is always relevant, people might not uh, you know, uh, realize that or live with that, but in fact is. So the relevance of Tanya is uh, not lesser, but if anything increasing, especially in difficult times, like we're, you know, before uh, the goal of the final redemption um, and it becomes, uh, so real to people today um, in, in, a, in a meaningful way that is changing people's lives, which is beautiful. Uh, a woman who was from all her life started learning Tanya, and the way she described it was, it's oxygen. Tanya is like the oxygen of Torah. It's, it's alive, it's a living thing. But here, here's one of, the, one of the many ways we could understand a little bit of this. What, what is it about God himself? There are many levels, degrees of holiness, godliness, spirituality, higher worlds, highest worlds, the highest angels, the highest souls. But holiness, godliness, and the physical are incompatible. Infinite and finite, incompatible. You can't put infinite energy into a finite uh, mechanism, into a finite keli. So the higher you go, the more, the further you get from the physical. But when you talk about God himself, there's absolutely no difference between the physical and the holy. God can be the highest of the high and the lowest of the low at the same time. That's what's unique about God himself rather than levels of godliness. In levels of godliness, there, there are restrictions. What is high is high, what is low is low. The high can't be low and the low can't be high. Like for example, the, uh, the Odin, the ark in which the, the 
the Ten Commandments were contained, they had to have a specific dimension in order to be kosher, the Ark. And yet at the same time, it took up no place at all. It was beyond, you know, beyond space. So it was infinite, not limited by space, while at the same time, it had a definite dimension so that it fulfilled the requirement. The hill that's, of Harsher. That's in the Holy of Holies, right? Right. So that that's God himself. So who reveals God? Ah, but, the ten, the, but the Ten Commandments are Torah. And the Ark that held the Ten Commandments had this ability to be infinite and finite at the same time. The Pill of Harachir says a vort. What is the difference between a Bainani, a Tzaddik, and a Rebbe? So a Bainani, right, someone who has mastery over their behavior, of thought, speech, and action, is a limited person, is a limited individual. A Tzaddik is without limitations. Zain Saif, limitless. And what is a Rebbe? Is the Chibur, is the connection between that which is limitless and limitation. It brings the two together, like the Aaron, right? What does that mean? Um, what does that mean? It means you can take the that which is so removed and so distant from limitation and bring it and make it real in, in the limitation. Can take a Rebbe, can take something and that the Benini or a Chosid uh, can now, it makes it real for them. The tzaddik doesn't have that power. The tzaddik is in his own world. Uh, with that, you know, uh, when I heard that word, the, the hayoim yoim from the Rebbe, as there used to be a, a prophet and the people, I mean, the prophet was in his world alone. And the people were alone. And then there was the sage and the student. The sage was in his world alone. And the student, and then came a Rebbe and a chassid, and came on Nishtalent, and we're never alone. You know, in the world that we live today, and especially with COVID, I don't know if you know what's going on in Montreal over here. Here they they're closing, they closed everything. Mishagas <laughs> can't even come to synagogue, to shul to pray. Ad <laughs> So far, so far. So there's there's such a, a feeling of being alone, which is a deadly, very deadly. And what is a Rebbe? bring to us and what do we bring to our Rebbe that we're never alone and by teaching the Alter Rebbe teaching us Tanya that notion that there's always a sense of connection always a sense of um, you're not there on your own is very real whether it's because God is with you or that the Rebbe is with you the Alter Rebbe is with you, Siddim are with you, others are with you. Know, you don't have a sense of alone. Now, sometimes you might feel a little lonely, but you're not alone. And today in the world that we live in, that's a, a very, um, it's, a, it's very dangerous. Tanya is the, the remedy for that. And that's what the Alter Rebbe does. So it says about Torah, it says Torah speaks in heaven, but affects earth. Medaber b'shamayim, but has a, has a power over earth. The ability to do that is actually something new. It's not like in the, in the generations before the Alter Rebbe, they failed to do it. It was simply not doable. The Alter Rebbe opened up a new pathway or a new gate to heaven where you can actually do that. Meaning you can see the, the combination of the highest of the high and the lowest of the low in the Torah. So, I mean, the whole story with Yotes Kislev, 
the Rebbe had to face a trial, a judgment, because he was he was revealing stuff that wasn't meant to be revealed. What was that? What did he say that nobody was supposed to know or didn't know beforehand? After all, Al Tadebu was just explaining what the Baal Shem Tov said. <laughs> so, so the Baal Shem Tov should have, should have been in jail. <laughs> It was a malakit only, right? Right. <laughs> only a compiler of uh, previous teachings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's let's get right to the point. How is God more knowable today than He was a generation ago? I'm assuming He is, right? We're making some progress. So how is he more knowable? What do we know about him today that we didn't know before? And by the way, <clears throat> the, the, the secret that allowed Hasidim in Russia to outlive communism to out-survive communism, in some sense, to actually defeat communism. Because they tried so hard to destroy godliness. And with all their awesome power, they failed because Chassidim wouldn't quit. So in some sense, Chassidim destroyed communism. But what gave them that strength? So some people talk about in Muna, they never, they never lost faith. Bitochen, they never lost trust. That's not an answer. That's part of the question. How do you not lose your faith and your trust in 70 years of horrific suppression and repression and oppression. How, how? In fact, your emuna could actually be, your emuna could actually convince you to give up Judaism. Because you know God runs the world. You know that everything happens by divine plan. And here it's impossible to keep Judaism under Stalin and Russia. So God must be doing that. So God knows that it's impossible. So you're Potter. Take a brief recess. 70 yeah, years or more. People said, when Stalin dies, we'll go back to... So your Amuna could not survive it. And the question is, how did Chassidim do it? And the only answer is, by, by the sixth generation of Hasidus, Hasidim saw God as the reality, not the Amuna. God was not something they believed in. Just like you don't believe in gravity. It's your everyday reality. You let go of your pen, it falls down. So now do you believe in gravity? <laughs> Why do I have to believe it? I see it. So the Ebishta became actual reality. So to the Chosid in Russia, Taira and what Taira says is much more real than what Stalin says or does, what his, what his soldiers say or do. So what's the question? This is bluff and fake, and this is real and, and eternal. Well, there's no contest. The question is only how much pain can you endure? But there was never a doubt about what's real. So what do we know about the Ebershter that we didn't know before? So 
So I really like to use a very simple example. People who learn Torah, even the biggest scholars and true scholars, not people who are legends in their own mind, but people who are actually legends in their own time. <laughs> Ask any of them, does God have an arm? No, of course not. Does God have eyes? Of course not. Does God have a mouth? No. Does God get jealous? Don't be ridiculous. Does God get angry? No. Does God get pleasure from your mitzvah? No. God is not human. Don't attribute human qualities to God. So although the Torah does, because the Torah is full of these expressions, Yad Hashem, Pi Hashem, Eine Hashem, Dvar Hashem, Rotzen Hashem. Not to be taken literally. Very clear, very strong. One of the first things you learn in Yeshiva is that these are not meant to be taken literally. Well, there's, there's a real danger in that, isn't there? When do you stop? Where do you stop? God says, if you do this, you're going to suffer death penalty. Not really. It's just a way of, you know, intimidating. Putting in line. Yeah, it's like, I just want to impress you, but, you know, like somebody says, if you say one more word, I'm going to kill you. I'm not going to kill you. It's just an expression. Okay, so one by one, you can eliminate all the mitzvahs. But that is, or was, the, 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 accepted, the accepted opinion, the accepted approach. So Yad Hashem, no, he doesn't have a Yad. Pi Hashem, no, he doesn't have a mouth. Even Dvar Hashem doesn't mean he spoke. It means he uh, made known somehow, but it's not speech because he doesn't have a mouth and he's not human. The result, and I think most people can recognize this, and the result is that when it comes to talking about the Ibishter, there's really nothing you can say. What can you say? Whatever you say is wrong. So what is the, the consequence of that is that everything is going to become then a reward and punishment because it's not about the, the connection or the disconnect. It's not about the relationship, right? It's going to be about what I have from the Abishir, what I have from him is going to be the, the, the natural consequence of such a, a thought process. Or a more refined philosophy by some people. No, the mitzvah does connect you to God. How? It's a mystery. We don't know. It happens on some soul level, which we can't understand. But yes, it does. It brings you closer to God. How? How is that possible? Don't know. Okay, and Munapshuta. So, my granddaughter was upset and crying because her doll broke. The arm came off. So I sit down with her and I say, Oy, I can't believe how much that must have hurt. Can you imagine how much that hurt? And she starts to laugh. And she says, it didn't hurt. I said, how could it not hurt? The arm came off. 
She says, it's not a real arm. This is a six-year-old. Says, it's not? It's not a real arm? She says, no, it's plastic. Aha, you're right. A real arm is not a plastic arm. Oh, so what's a real arm? A real arm is a bone with skin around it. What, that's a real arm? It's just a bone with skin on it. What makes that a real arm? Because it can move. Yeah. So, so can a bug. Here's the point. When the Toyota says God's arm, we're talking about an arm, a real arm, a literal arm, an actual arm. You mean like mine? <laughs> no. Your arm is only an image. You have something like an arm because you're created in God's image. But his arm is the real one. You're the analogy, right? You're the marshal. Facsimile. Yes. So instead of saying God's arm is attributing a human condition to him, that's the opposite. When you describe your extremity as an arm, you're using a godly term to describe yourself. It's not anthropomorphic. Anthro means human beings, like anthropology. Anthropomorphic means you're attributing a human quality to God. No, it's the opposite. When I say my arm hurts, I'm being theopomorphic or diopomorphic. <laughs> I'm attributing a godly quality to myself because I'm created in his image. But the sages remind us, don't take your arm literally. Your arm is not the literal one. It's only an image. It's only a... So people in the yeshiva world are very familiar with the term kaviyachal. When we say God got angry, we say kaviyachal. As it were. As it were, as a manner of speaking, so to speak. God feels your pain. <laughs> Not really. It's just a manner of speech. So why would the Torah do that? Torah is Torah's emes. You have to be careful with every word and every letter in Torah because everything is meaningful and real and true. And then every other word, nah. <laughs> this is terrible. So we got it a little backwards. It's not that we shouldn't take it literally, all these expressions. It's that we shouldn't take it physically. God's arm is not a physical arm. You know why? Because the physical is not real. And his arm is real. And of course, the proof is his arm can split a sea. What can your arm do? <laughs> he doesn't really speak. Human beings speak. God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now you try it. <laughs> That's what Elio and Navi said to the worshipers of Baal. Call out to your God. Now, louder. <laughs> Louder, say it again. Your speech is not effective. 
because it's only a copy of the real thing. So the question really is, it's the Torah that says a human being has an arm and uses the same word when it's describing God's arm. So the question is not, does God have an arm? The question is, why is your arm called arm when it's not really? So what's Kaviyahu? We are. We are the Kaviyahu. <laughs> <laughs> which, which then leads to a very amazing um, takeaway, is that we don't have to take ourselves so seriously, but God, we have to take very seriously what he so, needs from me and what his purpose is that he created me in this world. I have to take very seriously. But me, if my arm is like this, or uh, I didn't uh, exactly get what I wanted in that, in, in, in this way in life, and so on, that, that, that's a kiviochel. It's not mamish. It's not truly real. And uh, we can uh, we can manage. We can manage. Yeah, that's, what the chassidim, so that's what the chassidim had that strength in, in Dora Shishi, yeah. right? In the second, in the sixth generation, because it was so real to them, yeah. right? And then in our generation, the, the Rebbe added something to all of this that Mashiach is mamish, real. It's not a, um, a pipe dream. It's not something that is uh, an eventuality that, you know, well, has to happen. No, 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 no. It's happening. It's a it's a reality. It's it's a it's a truth uh, that we can see unfolding in, right before us. Um, right. So we have a bit of a definition. It's not that we need to have more faith or more belief or more emuna. It's that we have to we have to get it clear in our minds what's real. We grow up believing that the physical is real. If I can see it, if I can touch it, oh, now it's real. And there are even people who say, I don't believe in God because I can't see him. Nobody has ever seen God. So there's no, uh, there's no experience of God and therefore I, I don't believe in it. For anybody to say that in our generation, that is so backwards, it's so primitive. Even in science, even in science, we know that what we see is not the truth. What we don't see, oh, those are the powerful things. So what do you mean? You don't believe in something because you can't see it? What is this, the 14th century? Where, where, where is your head? The whole world is going crazy over a virus. Have you seen the virus? No, so, it visited, but I didn't see it. <laughs> right. <laughs> you got it, but you can So people will say, well, it's not visible to the naked eye, but it is visible if you have the right equipment put it under the microscope, then you will see it. So it is seeable, even if you haven't seen it. That's true. It's also true about God. There are things we know for sure that we are never going to see. So how do we know? Evidence. There is a certain behavior uh, out there in, in, in the cosmos. A, a certain planet behaves a certain way. We don't understand why. So we have absolute conviction that there is another planet nearby, which we cannot see, that is having this effect on the planet that we do see. That's a scientific fact. And you will never see that other planet. So how do we know it exists? Its effect. We see its effect. The same is true with God. 
we see creation, well, then you know there's a creator. Pretty convincing evidence. So you don't have to see God to know that there's a God, not just believe. And what, and the, then, Alter, and what the Alter Rebbe and Tanya gives us then is in how we live with that and be able to transcend the human condition and to live with that godly reality. Which, um, well, to put it in different words, the later generations of Chassidus, particularly the Rebbe of our generation, said every Jew knows that God is real. Not every Jew believes in God. <laughs> but the Jews who don't believe in God know that God is real. They have no doubt. It's a strange thing, huh? Every Jew knows God intimately. Do they believe in him? No. It's such an amazing thing. Mm. The uniqueness like, of the Jew. Yeah. Like the survivors who refuse to believe in God. There's no God. I don't believe in him. I don't want to hear about it. Why? Because I'm angry at him. You're angry at who? You're angry at the God you don't believe in. Huh? It's amazing. So Hasidus now is showing us that it's not just that God is real. The, the neshama of every Jew is completely in touch with that reality. Even if he says, I don't believe in God. And that's why you can stop a Jew in the street and ask him to put on tefillin. If he says he doesn't believe in God, who asked him? Who cares? Well, wait a minute. If you don't believe in God and yet you follow his commandments, isn't that a little hypocritical? Yeah, so I'm a hypocrite. But God is real. God loves a hypocrite. <laughs> <laughs> As we all are. And so, he loves us. So here's the final uh the final thought, because I have to go on to the next. Uh... We say God's arm is more real than ours. God's speech is more real than ours. God's pleasure is more real than ours. God's anger. Oh, God doesn't get angry. Human beings get angry. No, human beings lose control. That's not even anger. That's just blowing a fuse. God gets angry. Real. The real thing. So if all of that is true, then God must also be more real in his vulnerability. We are vulnerable. Yeah, but that's just a copy of the real thing. When people say, you know, God is humble. Oh, come on. <laughs> what, are you saying? what are you talking about? <laughs> what, what is he? Hum God is humble? Yes. Because if you have humility, it must be coming from his true humility. And you have a little copy of it. Same is true with unconditional uh, absolute program. God created the world for a reason. Is that reason necessary? Some people say, to God, nothing's necessary. He doesn't need anything. So when he creates a world, it's not serious. Only we are serious. Now, this is a takeaway. What does it mean to serve God? Ivdu es Hashem. 
You're not serving him. If he needs nothing, if he doesn't care, if he doesn't react, if he doesn't get pleasure and he doesn't get pain, you're not serving him. He gave you good advice for your life and you are following his advice. This is called serving him. Self-serving. But now, the way we're thinking about it now, it's, it's real. My mitzvah has now become more real. I'm literally serving him because he literally has to have this mitzvah. He's not playing games. So on the one hand, if he has to have it, then I'm sure he will. Not worried about him. <laughs> what he wants, he gets. So I don't have to worry about it. It is real, it's absolute, it's eternal, it's infinite, it's going to happen. Save Dovar Hakil Nishma Salikim Yira Vesmit. Why? You're not going to stop him from getting what he des- definitely, truly desires. So I'm not worried about him. But if I have the opportunity to do it for him, why would why would I give that up? Why why would I give that up? I'd be crazy. So now when I do a mitzvah, it is so much more awesome than I thought. It's not good advice for me. Where it's changing a world for good and, and changing and and like you said, giving divine pleasure, giving him the ultimate pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Amazing. With great success. Continuing to um to bring the message to this Tanya to the world. There's nothing greater and 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 more important in our days than than to bring this message. And we will uh finally bring the Gula. The redemption now. That's why it's so important to learn Tanya and to learn Hasidus. Because it makes it real. Yeah. Through Yediya. The mitzvah of knowing it. Hashem. Thank you, Rabbi Fine. Thank you, Rabbi Friedman. That's Locha Rabbi in your project. It's it's crucial. Amen. Thank you.